Now I'm going to show you how Druid works with Legos. As you can see before me, I have several different cards, and each one of these cards is doing a specific thing. Let me introduce them briefly to you. On this side, I have cards that are there for the Apache Druid. This is part of the Apache Druid cluster. On this side, I have some ecosystem projects that are needed either to ingest data into Druid or to store data for Druid. Let's talk a little bit more about the Druid processes themselves. Here, this is our master server type. Our master server type is there to do coordination. This coordination is doing things that the cluster have to be done cluster-wide, where the entire cluster needs to be coordinated to do a job, for example, or to move some data. This is what the master is there to do, to make sure that that data is finished moving, for example, or that that data has been processed. Then we have our query server type. In this server type, this is where we do our interactions. When we're a client and we're actually running a SQL query, for example, our client will call into this query server type and that query server type will then run the query for us and respond with those results. When that query actually runs, this, the data is not actually stored here. The data is actually stored on these data server types. And these data server types are important because they're do, there to do several different things. They're there to serve up historical data and to re retrieve data for those queries. They're also there to actually do real-time ingestion, as we're about to see in a second. And they're there to actually process batch data as well, which we're about to see as well. These data types are important because when a query actually happens, that data goes from the data these data server types over to this query server type. Another thing to know is that although I just have a few cards here, I am not doing a bunch of cards. Normally in a, in a Druid cluster, we would have lots of queries, lots of masters, lots of data server types all running with their individual processes. Another thing to know about Druid is that Druid has its own file format. It's a column-oriented format, and it's specific to Druid. And the importance there is because when we have our, a query that runs on our data, that data isn't just organized in, in some arbitrary format. It's actually done in a format that makes the queries in Druid operate significantly faster. And there's a lot of details that go into that file format. Now there are two, as we mentioned, there, there are two different ecosystem projects that are here. We have our S3 and we have our Kafka. We'll talk about the Kafka side in just a second, but here we have our S3. Now this S3 is called deep storage in Druid. Just so you know, in Druid, the Druid cluster itself is not your source or your final destination for your data. It isn't your durable store as it were. Your durable storage of data is actually in this deep storage. And this is an important distinction from other, perhaps, NoSQL data stores. S3 is your durable storage. And what you can do with Druid is you could actually delete data off these servers that you maybe don't need to run or you don't want to query. And at a later point in time, you could pull them back, back off S3 and put them back onto your data so that they can be stored and queried. So suffice it to say, we have our S3. Once again, in Druid, that's called our deep storage. S3 is an example of that, and that's our blob storage if you're not familiar with it. HDFS is another possibility for that storage. Well, here we have a file on our S3 storage. And as I just mentioned, Druid has its own file format. So we can't just pull this data, let's say it's a comma separated value or a CSV file or a TSV file, a tab separated file we'll actually have to use Druid in order to convert this file from the format that we have originally over to what Druid, the Druid format. So what we do is we will run a query or run a task through our master. We will ask our master to say, there's a file in S3, I want you to convert it or to make it usable within Druid or to ingest it more correctly. So what we'll do is we will do a batch ingest of that data. That batch ingest will call or, or, or make a start a task on one of these data nodes, these data servers, and say, there's a file here, I want you to read that, and I want you to put it into Druid's file format. Well, there's a, several different parts of what Druid's file format is, and one of those things is creating segments. So let's say we had a, a file here that was a terabyte, 
Well, we aren't going to, in Druid, have just a single file that's a terabyte. What we do is we try to break that up, and we break that up into segments. And so as we break that up into segments, those segments will get processed and then put back into S3 so that they can be processed or retrieved at a separate time. And you could delete them off this machine and at a, at a different time start to query them. So once again, the data in Druid is not single files, it's actually broken up into segments. And then these segments are then distributed out. So as we do this processing here on the, on the data node that's copied into S3, and then from there, that data, these segments, actually get distributed back out into the cluster. So once again, although we just see two different sheets here with or cards with data on them, we'd have many more in a bigger in a in a bigger Druid cluster. So here we have our segments. These segments are distributed out, and we'll talk about what happens when we query them in a second. So that's what what happens when we do batch ingestion. Once again, that batch ingestion happens from our data that is stored in our deep storage. It's processed by our data and then distributed out as segments. There's another type of ingestion that we may have to do, and that's real-time ingestion. So here we have, now we bring into Kafka into play. And let's imagine that each one of these pieces of data, or each one of these Legos here, is a piece of data or an event that's coming out of Kafka. Well, what will happen is we will kick off an ingestion. Once again, we'll contact the master and say, hey, we have a task that we want to run. That task will then be as assigned to one of these data nodes. And these data nodes will then be responsible for ingesting that data from Kafka or consuming that data from Kafka if you want to use the Kafka parlance. Now what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to, one of these data servers is going to have to consume this data. And as you'll remember, Druid has its own file format, so it's going to ingest that data, put that data into its own file format, and then once it has been processed, once that data has been processed by that data node, once again, we're not going deeply into the, the exact things of what's happening there, it will, in memory, keep so much of that data, so much of that Kafka data, and then eventually kick that out or save that out as a segment or a file in our S3 for our durable storage. From there, that data will then go into one of our data server types. Now, let's ingest a little bit more data. And so we have all this data coming in. We consume it here on our data node. Now, you may be wondering about how do we query this data. So let's kind of go through this because this is a difficult thing. If you've ever done a, a task with Kafka and you've ever wanted to do real-time querying of data, you have an issue where there's some, is some data that's historical, some data that's happened in the past, and some data that's happening now. And one of the real difficulties there is getting a holistic view or an overall view of what's happened both previous and right now. So here's what happened on that topic previously, and here's what's happening right now. If we do a query, oftentimes with, with some systems, we can only get out this, this previous data, this archive data. We can't get out this real-time data. This is one of the ways in which Druid really shines, because when we do our query, let's say I'm a client and I do my query, and I can actually the, what will happen behind the scenes is Druid will actually contact different data servers depending on where that data is. In this case, if we say, hey, I want some data or I want to do a query, this query node, this, this query server will actually realize, well, the data exists here and here. And so it will contact both of those, both of those data servers. By doing that, we're able to query the data that's historical, as well as the data that's happening right now. And as a direct result, we can get all of the data. We can actually see all of the data at once and return a result that isn't just what happened before, it's also what happened before and what's happening now. And this is really one of those differences, one of those big differences between Druid and other places and other technologies. It's the fact that we can unify things that are happening in real time, a streaming, streaming ingestion, batch ingestion, and query all of that data together at once.